So if you've been around this channel any any length of time, you know that this episode is sponsored by Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. So I have to smoke a Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust cigar. <laughs> oh, that's painful. The hard part is choosing which one I want to smoke at whatever time. But I purposely chose this little spicy meatball of this pulpata because of its size. Now I love the flavor. It's a nice little spicy, nice full. A little kick. But notice I word, use the word little a lot because I don't need a long cigar because that's going to lean me to talk for a very long time on a subject that I can talk about a very long time. And that's about our generation. Right, I was born in 1970, grew up in the 80s, right, 70s and 80s, um, and it was different. It flat out was. If you're from that generation, you're probably saying, yeah, and you know what? I like it, but I don't like it. It seems like everybody is now on the bandwagon of talking about our generation. We have been that hidden generation. They call us the feral generation, and uh, it's been kind of nice just being... You know, you got your boomers, you got your millennials, you got your everybody else, and just us, we just kind of stayed off to the side, which for most of us, it's fine. Because for most of us, and I'm speaking in generalities, I'm speaking of my experience, the experience of people around me, that um, we spend a lot of time without supervision, right? Let's jump into it. Get up in the morning, summertime, and you would... uh. You get a bowl of cereal, sugary, sugary. Captain's Crunch was my favorite with the crunch berries. You sit too close to the TV because you'd go blind, which was a console TV, then big old monster things that you put all sorts of tchotchkes on top of because it was part of furniture, not just a TV you'd hang on the wall. You never think about hanging the TV on the wall back then, right? Because you couldn't. You'd have to prop it up in a cabinet. But you sit there and watch cartoons or Andy Griffith or whatever morning shows was there. But as soon as as soon as soon mom got up and she started moving around, it was time to get out that house, get dressed, get on your bike and go. And we had, I had, a big area to go, right? Some of it was wooded. Some of it was parks. Some of it was neighborhoods. Some of it was everywhere else. Usually it was a big street that you're not allowed to cross. And that would just be your territory. And nobody would know where you are. You come home for lunch, maybe. But you better be in the house by, that's right, the street lights. As soon as street lights came on, you get in there to eat. And when you sat down and ate, you ate what you got or you didn't. Um, I remember one time we were, we were a struggling family. We were lower income. And it was the end of the month and mom had did her best. And she had made something that just wasn't very good to me. It was substantial. It was gave you the needed nutrients but flavor not so much the Sunday before the Sunday comics came out remember them in the newspaper remember that there was a family circle that little circle with the one little line and there's you know a little picture and there's Billy showing her mom something or Billy's mom said eat your food they're starving people over in Ethiopia or people in wherever. And little Billy said, well, why don't you put it in an envelope and mail it to them? Well, I showed it to my mama that Sunday before this dinner. And she laughed. So we're sitting around the table, by the way, had them yellow pleather chairs and plastic naga hide. Never caught a naga myself, but the hide was on most of my stuff, including the station wagon we rode in back seat facing outward to the back and so mom said eat your food you know there are children who have no food and you should be grateful you have food and so i said well why don't you put it in an envelope and mail it to them thinking i would be funny like billy and mom would think it's funny well when i picked myself up off the floor with telling my pulse by the swelling in my lip that was growing i learned that Cartoons on paper do not translate into conversations with mama. And what did I do? I picked up my chair. I got there. I sat down and I ate my dinner. Nothing was said. 
my sister, she didn't say a word. My dad didn't say anything either, and neither did mom. We just went along while I was going on, and that was part of my childhood. But I would go out in the woods, and I would, I would collect beer cans so I could turn them in. I'd, I'd go going through the ditches off the main roads and find Coca-Cola bottles, Pepsi bottles. I rinse them out and I take them to the to the local grocery store and get ten cents a piece. You can make money as a kid. Got a little older, we mowed lawns, right? Hook that hook that lawnmower around the back of your bicycle and go riding through neighborhoods. Make twenty bucks, ten bucks to cut somebody's grass. You're always on your bike. You're always with a group of friends. You're always looking for a pickup game of baseball, football, dodgeball, tackle the man with the ball, whatever ball you could do. And if that didn't work, you found some lawn darts. Boy, lawn darts. Boy, I miss lawn darts. We play suicide. Not that I would suggest this generation coming up because this generation has not been seasoned like our generation was. We'd stand in a small spot. And we throw a lawn dart straight up in the air and see you could stand there the longest as this lawn dart is plummeting back down to earth and the possibility of the top of your head where you had a ball cap. Wasn't going to stop it. But you know what? You would have a story to tell. Never did I hear of or never did I see or never did I be a part of anybody that got impaled by a lawn dart. But I can say there were many, many, many close calls. When you play lawn dart, you're supposed to both stand on one side. You got a hula hoop on one side, a hula hoop on the other, and you stand on one side with the other guy, and you throw the lawn darts over to the other side, and then you go over, you pick them up, and you throw them back. So nobody gets impaled, right? No, that's no fun. You stand right behind the hoop that the person is throwing at, and then after a while it gets boring, you take and you stand in the hula hoop and see if you can stand there while they throw the darts at the hoop. Luckily, you made the dart hoop far enough apart that the aiming was not accurate and nobody got impaled. So then if that got bored, everybody had a pocket knife, right? You got to have a pocket knife, right? A little Barlow, a little whatever, a little, little Hickory, a little Whittler. You had to have a pocket knife, not to defend yourself, but because you're a boy. You're supposed to have a pocket knife. And so we would start playing stretch or mumbly peg where you take your pocket knife out You'd stand a couple feet from the other guy facing him, and you would take and you would throw the knife into the ground. And if it stuck in the ground, you had to stretch that leg out to reach that knife. You could pick up the knife, you throw it to the other side. And the name of the game was you tried to get them to stretch farther than they could reach, and then you won, right? And there's many days where I was laying on my belly, fingers barely touching the spot where the knife was, toe poked out to where the other one was. By the way, them Kmart shoes, tracks. No beat up shoes. You throw the knife and, and if you really thought that, that you needed to get back up and you couldn't stretch no further, you try and take and throw that knife right in the middle of between the guy's legs or if he's laying down like I was, right in front of his face to stick it. And if you could stick it right in front of him between their extended appendages, big word, you could stand up and start again. Now, I will say, there were times where um, the pocket knife had come in contact with somebody, sometimes me, sometimes the other person, hardly ever in anger. Luckily, we had on thick clothes. I mean, we had tough skins from Sears, right? Mama take me in there, you'd have to get fitted because you'd get pants and they'd have to make sure that you didn't have too much room in the waist, which is always a wonderful thing when your mama goes in there and she pulls you out of the dressing room and she sticks her fingers in the back of your pants and she wiggles you around like she's trying to pull out change. And then the lady who's working there, she had to wiggle your pants like that too. So you get a little wiggle, you get a little weird feeling going on. And if they were tight enough, they'd sell them to mama and mama would take them home. Because here's the deal with tough skins from Sears, back when Sears and Roebuck used to sell clothing like that that fabric was thicker than thick and their deal was if your boy could wear out the knees or the seat in those pants before he couldn't button them up you got a free pair and so you would you would wear those things till you wore them out and if you wore them out before you couldn't fit them no more you would uh you get a free pair I will tell you, I was tough on tough skins. I wore many a pair out before I could outwear them. I did. I did my best to do that. 
thinking I was helping out the family financially. In other words, I was just trying to get in trouble. We get lost in the woods for, for hours upon hours upon hours. If we ever got bit by a snake or a spider or absconded, nobody would ever know for a day, at least until the lights came on, and then they'd have to hunt you and figure out where you was at. Got in lots of trouble. Nothing really serious, but we did lots of little mischief and playing around. We started putting those little snake things that you could buy that you light them up and they turn black and they wiggle and curl and they become this big nasty piece of thick ash. We put them in mailboxes and we'd set them off in mailboxes or we chunk rocks at, at old buildings that were condemned and bust out windows. I did. The, the, the statutory limitation on that I think is over so I can talk about that. We get baseball cards with the gum used to have gum in them bad gum but gum we put them in our bicycles with mama's um clothes pans we get in trouble about that because we lose clothes pans and they would rattle like a motorcycle as we're going down the road feeling like a boss if anything would fit piece of wood piece of pipe your friend next to you whatever you make a jump ramp and you would sit in there and you would jump ramps all day long and it would get crazier and crazier and crazier. I remember a couple times where we used flip-flops as a stand for the ramp and see if we could jump the ramp without dropping the flip-flops. Never worked, but it was worth trying. Then we'd lay each other down at the end of the ramps. We'd try to jump over people like Evil Knievel did. <laughs> I was a big boy. Still am. Run my bicycle a lot, but I can never get up a lot of speed. We're in Florida, so it's flat. There's no hill to run down we're talking about. And so if I lay down and you jumped over me, then eventually, it's fair play, I'd get to jump over you or attempt it. And I never could get up enough speed, and I think I had a little maniacal, maniacal ability upon me, and so I never really sped up too fast because I liked the sound of the guy going, Ugh! as I ran him over with my huffy bicycle. Yeah. Now that money I talked about that we got from coins and lawn mowers or, or from, from from bottles and cans and lawn mowing and any other stuff we could do. We go down to a little convenience store and we get some comic books. 65 cents for Marvel, 75 cents for DC. Pick up some of those some of those uh, now and laters. Um jolly ranchers in the stick that you'd bite into and it's sticking to your teeth you could pull your you could pull your um your fillings out some bubble gum maybe some of them little coca cola cap things the little little coca cola bottles that had the juice in the middle you could eat and you could drink or the wax teeth that made you look like a vampire had big lips like mick jagger right i mean you were cool as all cool you'd wrap your school books with grocery bags and you draw on them You'd save up whatever money you had during the summer because then you could go to the, the book fair, Scholastic Book Fair, and you could buy a cool poster. And you could buy a couple magazines and some stickers, maybe a neat pencil with the little thing wiggling on the top. You had all sorts of erasers. None of them worked, but they all looked cool. They stick on the end of your pen. I was left-handed, so I wasn't allowed to use the, the first ever erasable ink pen because I would smear it because my hand would draw across it. So I had to use pencils, but that's okay. Time was easier. Time was slower. You could go out and take your moments and pause. You go fishing if you had the place to. You could do all sorts of stuff. You can put bumblebees in, in, um, in shot glasses and shake them up, make them fight each other. Don't do that. That's not nice. You can do all sorts of stuff. You could build stuff. You could make stuff. You could dream. You could be an astronaut. You could be a fireman. You could be a physicist. You could even be a roller skate disco king on your front sidewalk. Man, neighborhoods had sidewalks that connected your world to other worlds and the worlds beyond to where you could just be. And it didn't matter if the people you're hanging out with look like you or they had the same amount of expense in their clothes that you did. You just hung out. And somebody, some mama, would come out with a whole bunch of those little freezy pops, that little thing in, in, in plastic that's froze. It's either grape or green or red or orange or blue or white. 
Then you take the scissors and cut the tops off of it, and you go out there and you just have a break. Man. I'm glad for all the things I have in life. I'm glad for all the things I've done in life. But there's many a days now I go back to wishing that I could have days like that again where I didn't care about bills. I didn't care about money. I didn't care about politics. I didn't care about the other people or getting run over by some group or some organization. I didn't worry about any of that. I just worried about being in the moment and having a good time. And you know what? At the end of the day, most often... The food tasted better, and the bed was softer because I slept a good, deep sleep. Why? Because I didn't weigh it down with cares. I allowed my dreams to dream, and I had worked up the reason I needed to sleep. Now, I look for naps every chance I get. But, it's a little walk down memory lane. And I could go on forever, but I won't. Leave me a comment. Tell me what your experiences were as a kid. And if you're not in my generation, my condolences. But you've probably got some great stories of your own. I'd love for you to leave me comments for that. I don't care how many pages of comment you take up. <coughs> if you write it, I'll read it and I'll comment back. I will. If you ain't subscribed, do it, would you? Ain't going to cost you nothing. Content's not going to get better. But that's okay. Hit that like button. I'd love to get some of those. Helps our analytics. It really does. So, that's it. I'm going to go. Man, I hope your memories are great, but I hope you know your future is even better. It is. I hope you know I love you. I do. I'll see you later. Later, Tater.